Have you ever heard that song before? Yes. We've all heard this song before. Okay. Does anybody know who sang this song? Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan. Okay. So, does anybody know when the song was written? When the song was written? Does anybody know why I love Taika Da? Because everyone's smarter than me here. Exactly, 1962. Let's have a round of applause, please. Okay, now, why would I stand on stage in this beautiful limelight with people much smarter than me and ask you if you knew a Bob Dylan song? Does anybody know why? Do you know how this song is created? Is this song only questions or is it answers? This song, do you agree with me, is only questions. Right? And this, I believe, maybe, is what we need to remember. That our job, maybe, if you agree with me or not, you don't have to, is to ask questions. Not to be the sage on the stage, but to be a learning coach. This is why I've asked my students to call me coach. I say, call me coach. Coach Robert, Coach Johansson, Coach whatever you want. Zhao Lian, whatever you want to say, whatever you want to say. Because I really believe that our mandate, our mission, is to be question answers and not to pretend that we know everything. And the reason is very crass, very rude, very honest, because I'm supposed to be honest when I hold the microphone. It's my oath to being a speaker, basically, try to be as honest as I can. And the reason is because it's my heart attack. I'm not going to have a heart attack because I'm angry at my students or because I'm frustrated at my students or I'm, I'm just disgusted with the whole teaching field. I hate the Minister of Education, da, 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 da. No, that's not going to be my heart attack. I'm not going to give anyone that right. And the reason we started with this song is because I love to ask questions. All I do is to ask questions. People say, how would, could you learn Taiwanese and Chinese? I mean, it's not good, it's not perfect, whatever, but, you know, I, I can get around pretty well speaking Taiwanese. Uh, and the reason is because I ask questions all the time. And if you go out with me, you will just know it's really boring. And I'm always asking questions. Okay, sorry, I'm not supposed to speak another language other than English here. Okay, do you notice anything weird about my PowerPoint above me? Is there an object on there that you may think is a little out of the ordinary? Maybe I should give you the full view if I can. I'm such a... Okay, I'll just give... Okay. I stay home. Okay. Yeah, do the full screen. Sorry, I'm so lazy about this. Okay. So, do you see an animal? Yeah. What is it? What is this animal? Uh, <laughs> this is why, why do I love Taikada? Everyone is smarter than me. <laughs> I was sitting there, okay, you, you probably don't know this about me, but I have a very strange bicycle. All my, I'm a bicyclist. I'm kind of a, I'm a hippie dressed in a suit. Everywhere I go is on a bicycle. I've always got my gloves, my helmet, my lights. This is what I carry around with me all the time. Because these are the tools of my trade as an anti-car person. I'm an anti-vehicle person. So 
I love bicycles, and it's a it's a it's an eco uh, eco uh, it's a uh, naturalist kind of thing because I'm I was born in Austin, Texas, which is in the middle of a very very conservative, very very conservative state, in an oasis of hippies, into a family of hippies. My father drove a pink Volkswagen van, to, and my mother's name is Geraldine, but they called her Jerry. So everyone thought that I had two males as a father, and that made me more of a hippie. So I was a big hippie growing up. But one day, I was, I was riding my bike, and I received a phone call from a very distinguished professor. And she said, hey, Ahan. In fact, I can't tell you who she is. I can't tell you where she's sitting. I cannot give you any hints. Okay? And she said, hey, what are you doing on, on, on September 1st? And I said, well, geez, probably the same as always, just sitting in my office doing something at the international office, maybe talking to wonderful Steffi, who's right there, okay? My hero, my shiro, okay? And, and I, she said, can you come to my office? And I said, yeah, sure. Sure, I'd love to go see your office because it's right down in the elevator. I have to wait 15 minutes for the elevator, but I'll probably be able to come down in the next 10 minutes because I'm upstairs in this building. And then she says, let's talk about EMI. And I said, oh my, oh my Lady Gaga. I've got to talk about equity mortgage uh, investment processes or something magnetic. And she said, do you know what EMI is? And I said, yeah, 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 sure, yeah, you know, yeah, sure, EMI. Yeah, okay, I'll be down in 10, I'll be right down in 15 minutes. So I go to Wikipedia. And then I learned about the emu, which you knew and I didn't know. I thought this was an ostrich, so good job. Okay. And so then I started reading about the emu, and I was a little late for the meeting, sorry about that. But I started learning about the emu because I discovered that the emu is definitely not an American bird. Because, okay, now this, let me just tell you, this PowerPoint that we have here, I probably sent the wrong one down, so it's a little mixed up, but it's okay, because we're teachers all here, and we're used to this confusion. Okay, so basically, an emu is not a North American, us bird, for several reasons. One, the women compete for the men. Number two, the males guard the nest and the house. Number three, the male loses a lot of weight once the babies or the, the, kid, the, the chicks are hatched. And the last, but not importantly, is that number five, the, the, the young little emu, emuettes, the little kids, are raised only by the father. And the mother just goes out. This is not a North American bird, so I was so fascinated by this. And then I realized I'm supposed to give a talk about EMI, and I have no idea what EMI is. And I, I, I have these, two fam these three famous... Uh, degrees and I'm supposed to know everything and I was like, oh man, I really don't belong at this university and I was like trying to fight the tears and then I found out that it's not a common word and it's okay. And so I told him, I say, hey, it's okay if you don't really know what this is, that's fine. And then I started thinking, you know, I am the least, I am the least of all the people I know qualified to give this speech because I'm a native speaker so I know nothing about this. I know nothing about how to teach a class if English is not my first language, and I thought, gosh, how can I do this? I, I'm, I'm always a yes man, so I, a yes person. So I said, yes, yes, of course I can do that, no problem. And I, oh man, what am I going to talk about? And then I just thought about, okay, when, when I used to teach German in, chi in, 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 in China and Taiwan, I used to teach German in, in, in China and Taiwan, and it was really hard for me because I had to teach German in Chinese and German's not my native language, and Chinese obviously is not my native language either, so I can sort of understand a lot of the, a lot of the, the uh, cognitive dissonance, a lot of the, the anxiety you're going through. And so I just thought I would share a little bit about like, what I do in my classes, and maybe this could help you a little tiny bit in your classes. And if it doesn't, hey, you can get your money back. I'm so sorry. You know, just, just talk to the language center. They'll give you your money back, you know, your money back, whatever, 30-day guarantee. But I'm just fascinated by Chester's talk. I mean, when, when, I, when I heard this talk this morning, I was actually kind of angry because I was like, hey, man, I was just going to show up and just go to my office and prepare for my speech and get my PowerPoint taken care of and all this. But I was so fascinated that I had to stay. And so now it's just crazy because my notes are a mess. I can't understand them. 
And let's just try to get through this talk. Okay, so in the back I have a gentleman named Tim. Now, Tim is my former student. Tim, how many questions did I ask already today? I would say 15. Okay, okay. Was that 50 or 15? 15? 15. Sure. Okay, so, so I've asked 15 questions. Okay, which is, which is not really good for, you know, so much time I've been on stage. So I'd give myself a 3 out of 10. Because I really believe that our job is to ask a lot of questions. Okay. Now, everybody knows my classes are really weird. And I'm really weird, so I have to wear a suit just to act as if I'm a professor. And I won't get kicked out of the university because I'm just a, a hippie in, in a suit. Okay. So, we have already know this answer, but can anybody tell me what is EMI? And please don't say EMU. What is EMI? Can anyone just share with us? And if you don't have anything to say, it's always going to be Tim I'm going to ask. So you're, you're in trouble. Okay, so what is EMI? Maybe something like English as a means for instruction, something like that, right? Okay, good. Okay, so why are we, why are we, why is it important? Why is EMI important? Who can tell us that? Why is EMI important? Why are we doing this? Our school has many international students. And if we don't teach in English, then these international students may not be able to absorb what we're trying to teach them. Okay. Now, what I just showed you, probably not perfectly, but what I was trying to show you was a question asking sequence. Okay. Now, whenever I ask a question, I really try to become a person that I'm really not, and that's patient. And I really try my hardest to slow down. And I really try my hardest to ask the question two or three times and then do something magical, which is called wait time. Wait time. Okay, Tim, could you please ask me a question? <laughs> Thai food with a, I had Thai food and a bunch of mineral water, and then, uh, then afterwards I had a, a bubble milk tea, boba. Oh, it's some theory about some Russian uh, guy who created this really cool thing called social constructor. Okay, that is the worst example of wait time you've ever seen or heard or been experienced to. Now, Tim, ask me the same question again, please. Please ask me the same question. Did everyone hear that question? Some kind of social theory. Exactly. Some, some guy's social theory. It, yeah, exactly. Like I, I think the question was something like, what... What is, the, what is the main idea of Lev Vygotsky's socio-cultural learning theory? Or you could say, what was Vygotsky up to when he created the socio-cultural theory? What was he thinking? Why? When? Right. This is how I ideally... I'm a liar because I really don't do this in every class and I'm cheating you and lying to you because I really am not this good. But I'm trying to pretend to you now that I am this good because I'm the one holding the microphone. But I try so hard every day to have this sort of interchange with my students. I, I try so hard, just like I try so hard to always wear a helmet, to always bring my water bottle, to always wear a tie, to always have my light. I try so hard. I don't always do it. I'm usually a failure, but I try so hard. And this is something I really think you may possibly could be, kind of, sort of, maybe, could learn from me today. And that's how to restructure the universe when you stand on the stage, because you must frame this room. You have to own the room. And what I learned from teaching for 30 years, from Literally in the womb to 95 years old students because I love Taiwan and the way you want to live in Taiwan if you don't have degrees is ESL, 
and that's in the in the the cyclists who must teach English, who don't have these degrees for whatever reasons, who have to teach ESL. I say, you mean English for a second language? And they say, no, eat beep to live. And I say, oh well, that's that, that's what you guys call ESL, eat beep to live. But whenever I teach, I try so hard to be patient. And I try so hard to repeat things over and over. And I think it's really useful for you if English is not your native language. Because what you're doing, you remember Chester talked about serving? Remember that, that wonderful presentation? Remember about serving when you play tennis, right? When you play that French game, tennis, right? And you serve the ball. Well, as a, as a professor or as the, the person on stage holding the microphone trying to control the room, you have to control the whole court. You gotta own it. You have to use every single skill you have to keep the focus of the students. And that's why after each class, if you're not dripping sweat, if you don't feel like a total failure, if you don't just feel as if you've run a marathon, then I think you're cheating your students. Every single class I have, when I come back, my brain is even more like spaghetti than usual. And I'm exhausted. And the reason is because I'm always trying to be another person. And I'm always trying to fake it until I make it. And that's what I want you to try to do, is to feel like you're not alone. We're all fake. We're all hypocrites. We're all thinking we're smarter than the students, and we know all the answers, and all need need all need need mail to get libo to get got what going way ah, lip and tie ah, right? You don't know what to do. You need mail to get get one talk about the things. Okay. But what I learned from 30 years of being a teacher, which is all of us have had this much experience, and I'm not any better than anyone, is to try to be another person whenever I whenever I present in speech, whenever I speak. Okay. So. My question is, how can you improve your EMI in 13 days? Because that's how much time we have until the semester starts, right? Something like that. How can we? How can we, how can we do this? Well, <laughs> Chester said it better than I ever could. So just get Chester's PowerPoint, download his, and learn. You don't have to worry about mine, because he said pretty much everything I was going to say, which is a good cop-out. But what I would do if I were you, which I still do all the time, is I would go to YouTube and I would just study other teachers. And I do this every day whenever I'm riding my bicycle after work, before work, sometimes during work. Oops, didn't say that. And I'm always learning how to be a better teacher because I really believe we're not teachers. We are lion tamers. We are lion tamers. We love the, the beautiful lions, the beautiful creatures, the beautiful students. We love them. But at the same time, we fear them. We fear them. And we know we have to use certain tools of the trade to control the narrative. Because I don't know if you've ever lost a group of students. It is like... 15 breakups with the love of your life if you've ever lost control of a class of students. It is the most depressing feeling you will ever have. It's when you know you've got 25 more minutes, the students hate you, nobody's listening. Basically, if you've ever taught before, you know this feeling. Right? And so what we need to do is we need to learn what the professionals, not me, but the real professionals, what they do. And you know what they do? They believe one thing. Less is always more. And they always know to bounce things back at the students, to ask questions, just to basically shut up. Let the students do the work for you. Because like I said, it's not their heart attack. And it's not like they're not going to go online and critique you no matter what, no matter what you wear, no matter how well you teach. They're going to hate you no matter what, just like we always hate the boss. So you've got to get used to it. We are the boss. So we have to use tricks to control these beautiful lions that we're trying to teach. And there's a lot of stuff online about this that you can learn from people much more interesting than me. 
Now, who is this? Can anybody guess who this is? This is me. Okay, this is me teaching a class. This is also me sort of about to teach a class. No, not that fancy, but like that. And the difference between them is it's the same person, but he's totally dressed totally differently, right? I mean, I would have a really hard time understanding why I would have to watch this clown talk for, two, for 45 minutes about EMI as opposed to this guy because he's got a tuxedo on, right? Now, I dress like this because I have to because I'm not a good teacher. I'm a horrible teacher. I'm a fraud. I usually don't know what's going on. I'm usually one or two pages just ahead of the students. I have no idea really what I'm doing in this job. All the students in Taiwan are smarter than me. All the students at Taikada are 10 times smarter than me, and that's a proven fact. Although I did go to Harvard many years ago when I was smart, but this guy is a total fraud, so he has to dress this way. And so whenever people say, hey, how can I improve my teaching? What can I do? I say, I don't know what you can do, but what I do is I try to dress up like I'm a professional. And I'm not saying you have to. This is just what I do. This is my costume. If you speak French, then you know they call this a costume. And that's my favorite part of the French language is they call this a costume in French, a suit. I put on a suit and a tie and I walk with these fancy shoes, make loud noise, they're walking down the hall like I really know what I'm talking about. And then I go to class and I do what's the most difficult thing in the world is to shut up and have the, form, the students form groups, let them formulate the questions, and let them present their answers to the class. And if I could teach you anything in the limited amount of time that we have is, I would say, what, what I do, you don't have to, doesn't matter. Everybody's different. I like to dress up. I like to have a really organized PowerPoint and things really organized looking so I can do whatever I want to do. Because my biggest fear, I'm not afraid of mosquitoes or snakes or, or mammals or emus. I'm afraid of students. I'm terrified by students after 30 years. And so what I try to do is I try to get them in groups. And I have them in different groups each class. And then I say, okay, we're going to do PBL. And they're what's PBL? Oh, you don't know PBL, problem-based learning. Let's come up with a bunch of questions related to the topic. And then let's ask each other a lot of questions. And group work, I really think, is the secret. I think it's the secret. And you all do this already, so I'm basically preaching to the choir. I know. But I honestly believe that group work is the number one thing you can do. Okay, so whenever I make groups, this is what I learned studying this, uh, getting my, you know, P, you know, you know, my degree, my PhD in, in foreign language education. What I learned was basically form a group of three to four people. Because three usually is like just enough to cause problems. Four, like they can cause problems, but five is really going to cause a lot of problems. Three to four people. And then everybody has a group. Roll. One is the scribe, which is the writer. One is the thinker, which basically doesn't have to do anything but just think and talk, but you have to give somebody a title. Then you have your actor. Then you have your police. And the police is the person who controls the group, the police person, the police officer, who's basically, hey, uh, stay on topic. Hey, dim them up. Be quiet. Don't speak Chinese. Speak English because we're trying to do this presentation. And the actor is the person who has to stand up on stage and present what they came up with. Okay? So everybody tries not to be the actor. And so I always because I've been doing this for so long and I know all of the evil ways of controlling human nature from doing this, is I always choose the, 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 the biggest, the worst uh, troublemaker in the group. That person is the presenter. And they're like, oh, you're like that. Right? And so I always choose the person who's going to give me the most trouble as to be the presenter. And they present. And it's so easy to teach this kind of class. And this is when I feel like the lion tamer 
has the lions totally tamed in their own little cage areas of the zoo or whatever, which I hate zoos, by the way, and I hate the metaphor, but it's just what we have to come up with. And so then when it's time for to let this group of lions, this beautiful mammals, out of their, or students, sorry, I shouldn't compare animal, uh, students to animals. I'm sorry about if I offended anyone, but I love animals. But I, I could have said emus or anything. Okay, I don't want to... Oh, I have to be careful here. But so basically, when I let them out of the cage, it's a controlled cage. And they think they're like, you know, born free, as free as da da da. But it's actually, I'm controlling the narrative because I know exactly how long they're going to talk, exactly probably what they're going to say. And I know their presentation is going to stimulate other questions. And if you're not a native speaker, this is like a birthday present. Because you just have to go, go to what Chester just said, go to that website full of English, uh, commonly used English words, I can't remember the name, or Coursera, or whatever, just get, get that website, and, and find out what the English transitions are. And just basically, just say things like, okay, that was beautiful. No, what does group two have to say about this? And then, okay, that's very insightful. How does this compare with the reading we did? Oh, you didn't do the reading. Oh, man, that's a disaster. Who did it? Anyway, what I'm trying to say is it's just like a opening up Pandora's box because you can just ask questions all day long. And next thing you know, the class is over. You, you, you don't feel as much like a fraud. You feel like you've actually taught them something. And the funny thing is you actually did teach them something because Galileo... I have to go through this because I sent the wrong PowerPoints. It's, not, it's nobody's fault but myself. I always try to shift the blame, but I can't shift the blame today. Galileo, that's not Galileo. Galileo said the most insightful thing that we can even, we all know this. We can't teach people anything. We can only help them discover it within themselves. And everyone on the planet, every teacher has said this in their own way. And if you just embrace this and just meditate on it and think about this fact, it could maybe save your teaching life. And it's basically, quit trying to teach people stuff. It's not going to work. It doesn't work. It just doesn't work. We have to have them discover it by themselves. They have to actually come up with this, like the beautiful thing we learned earlier about the echo. I mean, you, they, 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 they have to learn this on, them, on their own. They have to experience this. And so every class I start, I start with a song. Because I feel it's my, my job to teach English culture. I mean, that's just my, 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 my heritage. It's, I feel it's my mandate to start every single class by teaching the students a song. And I know that's weird, but that's what I do. That's what I do because I control the classroom when I teach. And you can tell I'm playing the crowd right now. And every single person in this room has had my eye contact because I know how to do crowds. Because if you don't know how to do a crowd, you can't teach. And so when I'm teaching, I'm never standing behind that, that what is that ugly, ugh, that, that thing right there, ugh. lectern, podium, ugh. I'm a, terrified of these things. Because this is the best way to lose control of the lions. I'm always walking along, you know, you know, hey, good job. Hey, here's a steak. Oh, here's a, oh, here's a bone. Okay. I'm always walking around like this because I can. Because I control the narrative of my classes. And if you can do that, then teaching becomes really fun and really interesting. And that's why I love to teach. I would never do anything else. And I'm a horrible teacher, but I love doing it. Okay. There's another guy. Does anybody, anybody heard about this guy? Anybody heard of this guy? I, I, originally, I brought a pair of socks, but I thought that'd be, that'd be too, too weird. I was going to say Socrates. Okay. This is Socrates. There's only four things we know about Socrates, because Plato was his disciple who wrote everything down. One, he was probably the ugliest man in Athens. Two, he was really super wise. Three, he loved to ask questions. And what happened after he asked so many questions? Does anybody know what happened in 399? Anybody know his end? 
He was forced to drink hemlock. He was executed. Because he was basically, I don't want to say this the wrong way or anything, he was basically a Republican Trump-supporting professor, which doesn't really exist to my knowledge. No offense to anybody. I don't want to talk about politics today, but basically his favorite country was not Athens or his favorite city-state. His favorite city-state was Sparta. He was, he was in love with Sparta. All he did was talk about Sparta. And so in 399, they had a trial. They executed him. So he, asking too many questions maybe won't go good for you. It's been good for me, but you know, whatever I teach you, be careful because you could get executed for asking too many questions. But why, who can tell us why Socrates is famous even though it's been you know, 2,000 years? Why? What, what's the Socratic method? Anybody want to tell us? Tim, you're dead because nobody's talking. This crowd ain't talking. You're dead. Okay, what's the Socratic method? Oh, there you go. You're lucky. You owe him. Get a dungeon I thought. Okay, exactly. Asking questions. And asking more questions from those answers. And the reason we started off with Bob Dylan's song is because that song is just all questions. And somebody said, hey, man, Bob Dylan, you know, bye, Bob. Why, why do you ask so many questions in that song that basically united a generation and was the, the brick and the mortar of the hippie movement that started these 1960s protests? Why did you just ask a bunch of questions? The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. You know what he said? What did Bob say, do you know? He said, in fact, I'm so stupid, I can't remember exactly what he said, but he said, it's impenetrably obvious. Because the answer is either so obvious that it's blowing you right in front of your face, or it's as intangible as the wind itself. And so the next time you teach songs to your students, which I do all the time because I really love music and I really think I've changed a lot of lives by showing students the deeper meanings of songs that everyone who, in my humble opinion, who's trying to learn North American U.S. English should probably know, I try to empower them because they, they could, you never know when, when they're running their own computer company, you know, Taiwanese people are so smart. When he's running his own company or his own entrepreneur, he could say, uh, he could just stand there and go, you know, with, with a spoon, bing, 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 bing. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a song to sing for you. This comes actually from the Bible. It's uh, based on, on uh, Ezekiel 12, 1 2, where God or whoever, and I'm, I'm not trying to show any religions, I really don't care, basically said, hey, you have eyes, but you can't see. You got ears, but you ain't listening. How did that Bible verse come into the song that changed a whole generation that became the, the, the greatest protest song to try to end this horrible Vietnamese war, this horrible war that started, it's a long story, but how did this happen? And Bob Dylan's just like, hey, it's a rhetorical question. And if we learn how to ask our students questions, then I really think we can liberate them. And if we teach them our culture, which I hate to say it, but I really honestly believe if we're teaching in English, you have to bring some of the English attitude or ph philosophy that quite honestly was imposed on my people 200, 300 years ago by the British colonial power, because I'm from the U.S., okay? When my people or whoever, blah, 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 were subject... subject subjugated or whatever, when that continent was taken over by the British as part of their colony, no offense if you're British, well, they brought with them this language English and we're now supposed to teach, you, teach with it as a method of instruction, right? As a medium of instruction. So I think we have a little bit of a, of a mandate to inculcate the philosophy of this language and the epistemological backgrounds of the 
culture and the philosophy into our students' minds as we teach with English. And so I don't really want you to think that teaching in English is just apple, cat, dog, banana, ESL kind of stuff. What we're really teaching them is, hey, I'm empowering you. I'm giving you a weapon that you can use for the rest of your life. And that's why I'm teaching you in English. And I'm empowering you because we all know, if you were to ask me, as I've been everybody every single day of my time on this planet since I came to Asia, which is 30 years ago, you know, I've been back and forth. They've said, hey, what languages? You're a linguist, or you think you're a linguist. What languages are the future? And, and I don't want to argue with you about this, but I definitely believe English is probably going to make it. It's probably not going to disappear next year. Mandarin is probably, Mandarin Chinese is, is probably not going to disappear in my lifetime. And Spanish definitely is not going to disappear. And so if I had people asking me, I'd say, oh, it's really easy. First learn Mandarin, then learn English, then learn Spanish. Maybe even Indonesian. Right? That, that's that's one of, what's something I love is uh, Bahasa Indonesia. But basically, anyway, I really honestly think that whenever we're teaching our students, we need to try to use this Socratic method. And we really need to try our hardest to arm them with the culture that is sort of comes along with the English language. And that's why in all of my classes, and my classes are definitely not better than yours. I know that for a fact, especially and though in the English why when she the law, so what does that well they could be on time and However, I really have to say, I start my classes with a song, and I teach them the meaning of the song. And either I sing it or they sing it. And I prefer them to sing it, frankly. But they never do, so I always have to sing it first, and then they sing it. And then, I, then we talk about how this relates to the curriculum of what we're doing today. And I know you're thinking, I know I can read, I can see your auras, I can read you. You're kind of like, hey man, we don't teach English. I teach biochemistry. I know, that's true. But you can always find a way to make some sort of a practical connection. For example, if, if you're teaching biochemistry or something, you could come in drinking a, a certain kind of a yogurt and go, I don't want to drink this because it has certain chemicals inside of it that kills the body. Da -da. I always use realia in every class. This is called realia. Every, I always come to class with some sort of a prop to use to, to support what I'm trying to teach them. And so, what you've seen today in this presentation is some things that, that I bring into every single class. And everyone's different. But some things you've seen is a little bit of suspense. Because we started out playing a song, which is really weird. And I didn't say, hey guys, how you doing? You know, I'm Robert. You know, nice to be here. I didn't do the whole show. I was just silent. And you're like, this is weird. Okay, and then I showed you a little bit about crowd control because I really honestly believe you have to control the crowd. You have to watch how to do a TED talk because if you can't control the crowd, they will definitely control you. You have to think of yourself as either a lion tamer or a coach or a learning buddy or whatever you want to think of, but don't think of yourself as some sage on the stage who knows everything and who cannot be doubted and oh I mean you can if you want but you won't last long because you'll end up in the hospital another thing I like is humor I like to use humor in my class just because that's humor and music are the way to touch the soul and it's my job is to touch people's soul I also did some unclear instructions when I was talking with Tim and that led us on to wait time and why we should have a student ask a question and then repeat it again. Tim, could you ask another question, please, so we can talk about this? Could you ask that again? I, I, I wasn't clear. Did, did you hear that question? Did, did you hear? Did you hear what he said? Oh, so so the question is, what is my favorite sport 
to participate in? That's what I heard. Uh, do you mean to play or participate? Play. 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 Okay, what's my favorite sport to play? Okay. Hmm. Well, oh, that's a good question. What is my favorite sport to play? How about you guys? Well, what's, what's your favorite sport to play? Tennis. 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 Oh, so your favorite sport to play but not participate in. Wait. To, <laughs> your, your favorite sport to play is tennis. Okay, very good. Do you like to watch it too? No? Oh, interesting. Okay. Did you hear what he said? What did he say? Tim, what did he say? Oh, you didn't hear. Oh, could you say it again? Okay, you like to play tennis, but you don't really like to watch tennis, right? Okay, okay, anyway, you, we're, we're, I don't, we don't have too much time to do the whole Ahan course thing. Okay, but basically, okay, so Tim, what, what did he say? Okay, very good. So he said, he said, I'm, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. I'm so sorry, I'm not good at, at names right now because I'm on stage and the lights are bright and I can't, I've never met you before. But let's just say your name is Arthur, or Arthur, the king of the Brits. Okay, you're Arthur. Well, Arthur, I'm, if I can call you Arthur, Arthur, what did Arthur say, Tim? Okay, so he likes to play, but not, what, what about you? Tell me about you. My favorite sport to play? Yeah. Ice hockey, okay. Okay, so anyway, I know this was a long-winded kind of a, it's like, that's not really how you do it, but that's, my job is to exaggerate a little bit how I like to slow down this universe to defy gravity whenever I teach and to really seriously hit home, not literally hit, no, and I'm not saying to hit the students, I mean hit home the idea that you want to reinforce in their minds the moment that the bell rings and they leave the class. Okay? And I just loved Chester's presentation because it reminded me of a lot of the things I wanted to talk about. And the one thing that I love, my favorite principle is the Pareto principle, the 80-20 principle. And so whenever I'm teaching, I know I'm going to feel really depressed after each class. I just always do because I feel like I'm a failure and a hypocrite and I didn't do what I was trying to do and I'm not good enough to be at this university and blah, blah, blah. And so one day my father, who's also a professor, he said, hey, man, you've got to learn the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule. He said, don't, hit, don't aim for 100 You'll never be able to hit a home run each time the baseball comes to you and you try to hit it. Just, just, just try to hit it in the outfield. Just aim for 80. Because you'll never, ever be able to satisfy everybody. Because in every single group of humans, uh, according to this Pareto principle, and you know this already. I don't want to ban the nunfu. I don't want to play with an axe in front of the expert carpenter band's house. But basically, if you just go for 80, and not 100, you're going to feel a lot better about yourself because only about 20% of the students are going to do 80% of the listening and work. And, or possibly 80% of the students are going to be doing all the understanding and, and comprehending everything, but 20% won't. And so if you just try to look at yourself as someone who's trying to just give a show, ask a lot of questions, be patient, but at the same time have principles, then I think your teaching could be a little bit less painful than maybe it is now. Or maybe it'll be more of a, of a religious experience than you're having now. Because I've been doing this a long time, and I really have failed over and over. And the last point on this list, number six, is called the halo effect. Does anybody know what the halo effect is? What's the halo? What's a halo? I love you so much. You know everything. I'm, do you want a helmet? I mean, do you need a light? I mean, you, you just, this is like a walking dictionary. You're like an encyclopedia. If you, you know everything, man. I, I'm, here, I'm, I'm giving you the microphone right now. Los Angeles Angels. Okay, the Los Angeles. See? see, that's an expert teacher. That's an expert teacher. That's how you get to become a Zure. That's how you get to be a Lingdao, Laoba. Is because he knows how to create connections between things. 
It's like a halo is that thing above the religious people. Now, the halo effect is basically the main idea of the halo effect. And I study this all the time because I'm trying to fix my teaching. And when I, when I try to meditate, which is very hard for me, when I try to meditate, I'm like, okay, God or spirit or princess or mother nature, whoever you are up there, how, how, how in the world can I become a better teacher? And God or the universe always says, go to YouTube, check it out, learn about different, different theories. And I'm like, okay, cool, that's cool. My cell phone's right here. And so basically the halo effect is the idea that if you're dressed like a banker, people are going to think you're a banker. If you're a good-looking person, then people are going to... It actually comes from this. And I don't have this problem at all. I'm like Socrates, obviously. But basically, if you're a good-looking person, people will think you're better than you are. If you're a good-looking person, you will get more respect from people because people automatically, as humans, will see you as being better able to generate the human species. And so this is the halo effect. And this is what I do every day to try to improve my teaching, is learning about these theories, because they really work. And so, going back to what I was talking about earlier, and you don't have to do this, it's just me, it's just because I'm so insecure about my teaching. I try to dress up like a famous professor. And before I go to every class, I, I look in the mirror, and I'm like, oh, dang, man. I'm just getting all ugly, you know, I'm like Socrates. Then I look at Socrates, well, I'm not that bad. But basically, then I try to get up my confidence to go to class. And then I try to do the things that we've been talking about today. I try to slow down reality. And I really seriously try to get students to engage in meaningful discourse as we negotiate meaning that's related to the coursework, okay? And I really believe that a masterful teacher, like Woman de Tourette, is able to take a very foreign concept and make it relate to something every day, like the halo. And if you can do that, then I think you're going to be able to master this job that we're trying to do. And these are some of the things we talked about today. Crowd control, humor, the Socratic method, which is just to continuously ask questions. Paraphrase. If I were a non-native speaker, I would be paraphrasing all the time. And it's so cool. When I was teaching German in China, I said, none you need each other, need each other. There's just some easy enough. And I have no idea like what to say. I have no idea what's going on. It's like way more difficult than my German. I say, and, and I just learned these, these expressions in Chinese that are basically like, you know, okay, well, that's good, but how does it relate to this? And then, okay, good, well, that, that's really nice. So uh, how would you use it in this way? Let's go online and figure out the real answer. And so I do a lot of paraphrasing, and I do a lot of wait time. Because the, I don't want to say anything wrong, uh, let me just say, whenever I teach, I get so excited about the job that I speak too fast. I don't do wait time. And I just answer everything quickly, trying to pretend how smart I am. And I totally miss the mark. And so when you're teaching a class and someone asks you a question, which in Taiwan they will only ask in the last three minutes, Ipso facto, therefore, when Chester was asking, hey, how do you end a class? I was like, oh, just, just, just hold your mouth, man. Don't talk. Just hold your mouth. I was going to tell, I was going to say, well, I have a trick, and maybe you can learn from this. Just, just, what I think is maybe you could end class early. It's the best trick in the world. I go, okay, well, uh, let me, class is usually over at, uh, you know, noon, but I know you're hungry. And why don't we just end class 20 minutes early? And they're like, oh, yeah, jie tuole, jie fan le, wome kei tao le. And they're like, oh, by the way, uh, uh, anybody got any questions? And they're like, oh, man, no, I want to go back to you. I want to go back to you. I want to go back to you. I said, okay, well, tell you what. I'll tell you, I'm going to let you guys go to lunch if you ask five questions. Okay, and they have no idea that they've totally fallen into this trap that I set. I gave them the piece of cheese 
and now they're in my mousetrap. And I say five questions, just five. Okay, we're gonna start out with you. And then, okay, and it's always crowd control. Okay, good, hey, put your backpack, backpack down. Hey, uh, tell me, what's the uh, wait time? Paraphrase, what, what is it? Uh, uh, and suddenly, they're really smart, because they're bakto yao, they're hungry, they wanna go eat lunch, right? And so that's how I end my classes. But you gotta be careful, because some people say, it's a trick. And there's a lot of zhang yanfa, smoke screen. Smoke screen stuff that you gotta play with your students. And, and I know it's maybe not ethical, but it's also not very ethical for us to have to stand in front of students who didn't do their homework, right? And, and it's not ethical for us to worry about these things. Because I'm not gonna have a heart attack just because my students didn't do their homework. No, I'm not gonna do that. That's not, I'm gonna go ride my bike around, have fun and relax and get skinny and enjoy my life. And so I think that some of these things can help you. And I know you're hungry. <laughs> I can see you're hungry. And it's always hard to speak right before lunch because everybody's like, oh man, how long is this guy gonna go on? Well, I can promise you three minutes. I can promise you that. Does anybody have any questions? Tim, ask me a question. Anything that's not going to make me uh, curse at you after class. Okay, uh, what, was, uh, what was your research about uh, your, uh, Okay. What was his question? Did anybody know? We're about to end class, kids. We're about to end class, but before we go, I know your girlfriend's waiting, your boyfriend's waiting, your whatever's waiting. I know you're hungry. I know you want to go get the first, uh, you know, before the... Okay, so what did he ask? Does anybody know? What did he ask? Anybody remember? Ask it again, please. What was your research uh, focus when you did your PhD? Okay, when I did my PhD, what is... Okay, I think the question, let's pretend we just did a, a, a paraphrasing, okay? The question was, and this is, this is how you do wait time really well. You say, the question was pause. The question was, what was the main idea or the research focus of my doctorate research? Is that, was that your question? Okay. Okay, well, to put it quickly, because we're all hungry, we all wanna go home, is basically, I researched the discipline-specific rhetoric acquisition of Taiwanese graduate students at a public university in the United States. And so my PhD was to study the learning of how to walk the walk, talk the talk, like a serious academic among five Taiwanese students. And I learned so much from this. And we don't have time to talk about it, but the main idea that I learned was exactly what Chester talked to you about today, what I saw this morning, was basically we need to teach students common, or we need to teach ourselves, and if we're going to teach you how to do EMI, we need to teach you some common transitions, okay, now some common transitions that you need to use if you're going to be teaching English, okay? And you have about 13, if you're going to be teaching in English, uh, you're going to be teaching using English as a medium of instruction, okay? And so what I would do if I were you, and if you want to train teachers, which I've done for a long time, is teach them the transitions, okay? Now, I, I have another version of this PowerPoint, and I'm going to give to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the language center, and maybe if you want, just, just nod your head, you probably don't really want it. But if you do want it, just nod your head. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah, okay. Okay, then you can probably access it somehow. And there's only, there's about a list of about eight transitions that you could use. But I would, I would go online and just learn the transitions because whenever I learn Taiwanese and Chinese, all of my friends, if they hang out with me for a while, they say, you know what, 
刚开始我以为你的中文真的很流利的很好，可是我现在知道你最后问题而已。Okay, so that's why I'm going to end my speech. It's basically a translation of that. Is at the beginning I thought your Chinese was really rocked, rocked the casbah. Then I discovered that your Chinese is really bad because all you do is ask questions and then you repeat what people say. That's exactly what I do to my students too, as I teach them the course materials. Thank you very much.